Good evening. This is May 12th, 2021, and this video is being pre-recorded, and it will be premiered at 6.30 p.m. this evening, so if you're watching then, then welcome. Uh, welcome as we premiere this video, and if you're watching it later, well, welcome as you watch it. Uh, either way, this is the Bible Study PAL, the ministry, the midweek Bible study, virtual midweek Bible study of the Palmyra Church of Christ in beautiful Palmyra, Indiana. I'm Greg Circle, uh, the preacher for that congregation, and we welcome you again, welcome you to our study of the book of Matthew. Uh, we're going to continue on. Um, yes, I am pre-recording this. I am at the church building, so things are a little bit different today. We're not going to be able to uh, pop up the Bible verses on the screen, so make sure you have your Bible, either in paper or electronic form, and uh, be ready to read. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. And let's start at verse 15. And remember, let's remind ourselves um, that this part of Matthew is about the rejection of the kingdom, rejection of various aspects of the kingdom. But we will, uh, and we have gotten into some aspects of rejecting things of the world as well. Like when we talked about the uh, Syrophoenician woman, uh, she, was, she had rejected um, saying the answer no um, from Jesus and rejected that the idea that the apostles had at least that Jesus that the son of god that the messiah was not going to help this uh Syrophoenician this gentile woman dog um as they saw her but and I talked about that a little bit on Sunday morning so uh we'd like we I encourage you to check out that lesson but let's go ahead and read uh, verses 15 through 20 of Matthew chapter 15, and let's talk about the rejection of understanding. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And I think this is the parable of uh, perhaps the blind leading the blind, I think. Uh, that's more of a parable than, uh, than the whole entering into the mouth of defiling uh, the man. But let's go ahead and read it anyway. Uh, Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth and passes into the stomach and is eliminated? Everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So you see Peter is kind of rejecting understanding here. Uh, he's, he's saying, I, I don't understand. and I don't know if he's rejecting the understanding or so much as he's, he's hearing it, but he's not, he's not, he doesn't want to believe it. He doesn't want to understand it, not, not completely, because it is a hard truth. And I know, I mean, we could talk about this either way. We could say, hey, this is Peter's, uh, the idea of Jewishness coming in. And it comes out again in the book of Acts, doesn't it, where uh, God gives him a vision of all kinds of unclean animals, and he says, rise, keep, rise Peter, kill, and eat. And um, Peter says, no, I've never... I've never eaten anything unclean. And God says, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And he does that three times, uh, three times total. Um, and you could say, well, you know, Peter's still got this idea that you know, what he puts into his body is what's going to defile him. And that's why washing your hands is important. Um, and again, we're not talking about hand washing for you know, making sure you get all your hands clean and uh, that we need to do today and we've needed to do all the time and, you know, all that fun stuff that we could talk about. But, um, but we're talking about being ceremonially clean to eat, uh, you know, washing your hands, not just, not just as a good practice, but as a way to show your piety. Uh, you know, I guess that's something that people have done in the past. Um, and so this is something that's hard for him to understand, that he has to put out of his head that this is not what defiles him. This is not what makes him unclean, ceremonially speaking. Um, but also I think it's probably the idea 
that, and, and it's in the whole idea of understanding. Um, Peter's still blinded. He's still a little bit blinded by the, um, by the teachings of the past, by the traditions of men that he has been following for, you know, however long. Um, you know, we always picture Peter as being older than, than Jesus. Uh, don't know whether he was or not, but either way, uh, he's, he's, he's going to be a leader. I mean, he's going to be an apostle. He is an apostle. He is one of the, cho the chosen twelve, and um, and he um, and he he needs to understand this. He doesn't need. He needs to be seeing. He doesn't need to be blind. God needs to. He needs God to open his eyes, um, but. Jesus is opening his eyes. He's trying to open his eyes. But Peter is saying, eh, are you sure about this? As Peter does several times. Um, I think we'll see that again here in the next chapter, won't we? That Peter's, Peter's lacking a bit of understanding. So let's, uh, let's move on. I think I've talked about that part some. Let's move on to uh, the next little point here, rejection of... No oh, this is the Syrophoenician woman. Well, anyway, let's read it. Uh, the rejection of no in verses 21 through 28. And again, I did this lesson Sunday for Mother's Day, so if you want to go back and watch that lesson, you may, but let's go ahead and read it. And we'll talk about it a little bit. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and beg, began, but she came and began to bow down before him, saying, "Lord, help me." And he answered and said, "It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." But she said, "Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table." Then Jesus said to her, "O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish." And her daughter was healed at once. So in that passage, we read about the Syrophoenician woman, and it's interesting because what, what has just been said, it's not what enters that defiles. Enter the Syrophoenician woman. <laughs> so I think this is another interesting point that uh, we can make here. Now we talked about it a little bit um, on Sunday morning that this was a Gentile, a, a heathen Gentile woman. And so for her to be talking to Jesus... Um, yeah, that took a lot of, of courage, didn't it? Um, because in the Jewish mind, this is, this is about as bad as eating with unclean hands. There's only, like I said on Sunday morning, there's only one thing worse than a heathen Gentile woman, and that's a heathen Samaritan woman, which we see in John chapter 4, but that is another lesson. Um, so, and here you have the apostles saying, you know, send this woman away, send her away. Make her, make her leave, please, uh, because they don't want to be around her. And so what you see then is um, Jesus, Jesus correcting this idea. And let's, let's see how. Let's see how he corrected it. Uh, we can talk about Jesus' statement a little bit, the, the insult uh, that so many people see. Was it racist? Uh, that's, uh, we mentioned that a few weeks ago. Uh, with the man, uh, the young theologian who says that this was Jesus being a racist uh, when he called this woman a dog. I'm not sure that that's the case. Uh, I'm, I went ahead and talked about that a couple weeks ago in a sermon, but also there's another perspective that we should take. Uh, this is what you guys sound like. <laughs> the, Jesus is saying to the apostles, look, this is what you guys sound like. It's kind of cringy, as the cool kids say. Um, it's cringeworthy that you all you all sound like this. Um, you know, this is a woman who needs our help. This is a woman who 
who needs, uh, who is begging, who is pleading for her young daughter's uh, life. And she needs our help. And, well, she needs, Jesus says, my help. <laughs> because, I mean, he's the only one who could, who's going to be able to help her. And she knows that. And that's why she keeps going. And uh, so then we read uh, Jesus basically saying the same thing he said to the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. I've not found such great faith in Israel. Uh, so... Again, Matthew's interesting because what is Matthew? He's a tax collector. He is a Jewish tax collector. And he, uh, he's pointing out, I mean, his whole message is to the Jewish, his Jewish audience who's saying, look, this Jesus is the son of David. All right, he is the king that is supposed to rule. He is ruling, but you, know, you all are supposed to accept him as the descendant of David. Um, I mean, then hence why he starts his genealogy at Abraham. But it's interesting that he really pokes at them by saying, hey, Jesus found faith in the Gentiles. So it's not just a lesson of this is Jesus as the Jews should see him. This is Jesus as... As you need to understand him, this is his kingdom as you need to understand it. It's not just, let me clear out my hands here, it's not just Jew and Gentile. It's not two separate kingdoms, but it's Jew and Gentile joining together in the same kingdom. And so Matthew's really important for that reason. Remember, he is writing to a Jewish audience. That is, that is his goal. His goal is to convert those who uh, grew up in Judaism. He's and he's and he's going to point out. Look, this is this is where Judaism failed. And if you remember, I think he points this out a couple of times. Uh, he's pointing out to the Jewish people that hey, if you remember, God said that this is going to be one kingdom, and we're going to have uh, we're going to have Gentiles in here as well. This is not a Jewish thing. This is a Jew plus. This is a whole world thing. All right. So let's uh, move on now uh, as we continue. Uh, as we conclude uh, verses uh, chapter 15, well, not concluding yet, I guess. We've still got a few. Uh, verses 29 through 31, they glorified the God of Israel. So this is not a rejection of the kingdom so much as it is uh, the result of... Uh, the result of Jesus' teaching and people are actually rejecting the world and thinking about the kingdom, at least, at least a little bit. Verses 29 through 31. I think this might be, I don't know. I won't, I won't speculate on what I was going to speculate on. Let's go. 29 through 31. Departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, he was sitting there. And large crowds came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So I think that's uh, Matthew bringing in, just like he did, uh, just like Jesus does with John the baptizer. He brings in this verse that, that talked about, this is what you're going to see when the kingdom of God is coming. Uh, this is what you're going to see. And Matthew says, you know, look at the scriptures. This is what you're going to see, and this is what Jesus did. As one teacher of mine said, same, same. I guess that's his way of saying you know, it's the same thing on either side. Um, so they glorify, but people did glorify God uh, in this, and you know, they they were understanding. Some people were understanding that Jesus was here, that God, that Messiah was here, that their King. Had arrived. The kingdom of God was coming. Uh, but next we find out the forgetful hearing is forgetful. Uh, let's read a few times this happened. The disciples forget. Uh, verses 32 through 39 of chapter 15. Uh, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. 
And I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, Where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And he said, they said, uh, seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men beside, uh, besides children, and, or women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. So the disciples forgot. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that they had, uh, they had fed the 5,000, that Jesus had fed the 5,000. And here we have the feeding of the 4,000. You know, we have more being fed by just a little bit. How quickly the disciples forgot. But we also... Uh, see in the next chapter uh, how the detractors forget. Uh, this is about the Pharisees. And in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees, okay, it's both groups here, came up and testing Jesus. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Show them a sign. Well, he has already shown them many signs. And that's, how, that's why people are glorifying God. If you look at the right signs, you're going to you're going to see the the truth but they're not looking at well yeah they don't want to see a sign it's too hard for them to believe but he replied to them when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red they want to tell the weather that's the sign they're looking for and in the morning there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So they have forgotten all these signs that Jesus had done previously. And uh, they, they want one more. They want one more. And Jesus said, you're going to get one more sign. You're going to get the sign that you cannot deny. And that's the Son of Man rising from the dead. After three days of being in the, in the ground, in the tomb. He's going to rise again. He's going to rise from the dead. So they forget. So the disciples forget, the detractors forget, and the disciples forget again. So let's go to verses 5 through 12 and read how the disciples forget again. Verses 5 through 12 of chapter 16. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out. And beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not He said that because we did not bring any bread. <laughs> Again, they forgot. They forgot not only about the feeding of the five thousand, but also the feeding of the four thousand, which just happened, you know, a small trip across the sea ago. It's more of a lake, but Anyway, he said to them, Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, I mean, he just, he, that's even in there. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, are we going to go buy leaven from them? Are, are we going to buy actual yeast from them? Um, Jesus like, guys. <laughs> the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's what you need to be careful of. That's what you need to be wary of. Um, so the disciples forget and because they're just forgetful hearers. And so it's a warning to us to not be forgetful hearers, but to be doers, which we're going to see, I think, a little bit later. All right. Peter gets it. Peter gets it. So let's go to 16, verses 13 through 20. And this is going to be pretty funny. Peter does get it here. 
Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He gets it. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So Peter gets it. Peter gets the point here. And, and because of this, Jesus gives him this, this great blessing. Uh, not that it's to him alone, but in this case it is. And I think, I wonder if it's because, you know, he's the one who says it. He's the one who makes this great confession before Jesus. Uh, and so because he confesses Jesus, Jesus confesses him. And he says, look, you're, you're going you're gonna to be this apostle that's going to, that's going to basically be giving the word of God. So upon this rock, you are Peter, and upon this rock. So it was Simon. His name was Simon, and Jesus kind of changes the name a little bit to Peter, which means rock. And then Jesus says, and upon this rock, what rock is it? It's actually the rock of the confession. That's the foundation of this religion that Jesus is starting. Um, it's the foundation of everything that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Um, so upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So, you know, we can look at the gates of Hades in a couple different ways. I think oftentimes we look at um, the gates of Hades coming in uh, and, you know, just thinking about that's how I've always looked at it. Maybe you're smarter than I am, but I, I, after looking at the idea, wait, these are gates. After looking at that word, I thought, wait a minute, this is us kind of attacking, or not us, but this is the kingdom of God attacking death. Um, and it's not going to withstand. We will overpower death, uh, physical death, um, spiritual death, but only because we are in the kingdom. That's the only place where this power exists. So keep that in mind uh, that this is, this is about the kingdom conquering death. This is about the king conquering death. This is about Jesus conquering death. He died and He rose again to die no more. And if we are buried with Him in baptism, we raise to walk in a newness of life, in a new life, so that just like Him, we, we can have that eternal life uh, with God. I always find it weird when Jesus says, don't tell anybody who I am. Again, I think He's trying to uh, lay low. He's not trying to... He doesn't want to speed things up. Of course... You know, if he did try to speed things up, you know, he could always, or if things did speed up, he always got away uh, before people took him, either to be a physical king, which never was going to be the case, or to, to crucify him, to crucify him prematurely. It wasn't the time, so he managed to get away. Uh, but it also, uh, I think it would have been a way to, uh, uh, if people were focused too much on this idea that He is the Christ uh, and then the enemies of Christ, the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming at Him, they, they upped their, their game a little bit and that would, that would detract from the message that Jesus was trying to preach, the help that He was trying to give. So anyway, let's go on now to verse 21 through... I'm kind of missing a... Oh, there it is, 21 through 23, where Peter gets it, and then Peter loses it. Verse 21 through 23, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me. No, 21. 
From that time Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised upon the third day. Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now He rebukes Him. What a change, what a change. God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, adversary. Uh, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. So Peter gets it, and then Peter loses it. You know, it's <clears throat> it's fun to see it's fun to see Peter doing that, uh, going back and forth. I think it's fun because it happens to us too, doesn't it? Do you, do you ever vacillate a little bit? Is vacillate the right word? Somebody will correct me. Um, you go back and forth between two opinions. And, and even sometimes, uh, you know, we're human. Sometimes our faith is just, it's just so small. And, you know, eh, we go back and forth or forward and backward. Um, but Peter, Peter overcomes this and ultimately gets it and gets it right. And it's because he listens to Jesus. He listened to God. So I always keep that in mind. Listen to God. Listen to His Word. His Word tells you. All right, moving on now. Uh, there's a rejection of the kingdom because of a high cost. Verses 24 through 28. In 24 through 28, we read, uh, Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, there's a high cost to following Jesus, uh, to being His disciple. And many people are not willing to take that, take on that cost. So they reject Jesus. They reject His kingdom. So what is the cost? What is the high cost? The cost is your life. Because you do turn your life over to God. You are to uh, take up your cross and follow him. You turn it over to God. You say, you turn it over to Jesus. You say, I want to follow you. And you take up that cross. You take up that burden. And you follow Him. But what's the cost of rejecting the kingdom? The cost of rejection, the price of rejection, is your soul. You end up turning it over to God anyway. And I think that's kind of a Kind of an interesting point. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. I should have looked it up. But the soul will return to God one way or the other. Now, which way is it going to be? Is it going to be that you have given it freely to God? Or is it that He's going to take it? And is He going to take it all, all clean and washed in the blood of the Lamb? Is He going to take it uh, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish? Are you going to give it to him that way? Are you going to fold it up nice and neat for your master and hand it over to him? Or is it going to be all tattered and shredded and dirty? And, and he just says, look at what you've done and takes it from you. Which way is it? Which way is it going to be? What is the price for rejecting him? Uh, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will you give? Think about that. Put, it's, he says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? But put you in that. What would you give in exchange for your soul? For the Son of Man is coming, is come in the glory of His Father and angels, um, and will repay every man according to his deed. He's going to repay. A vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But um, there's a whole lot more that we could talk about with that. And here's an interesting point in verse 28. Some of the disciples saw 
the kingdom. I mean, physically saw the kingdom. And that's what Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Uh, how near is the kingdom? And it's not, I mean, it is the actual kingdom of God. How near is it? That generation is not going to completely pass away. We can look and see that uh, if we just take the apostles here uh, as that generation... The only one that's not there in Acts chapter 2 is Judas Iscariot. He's the one that has to be replaced because he, uh, well, he, um, what's the word? I hate it when my mind goes blank on words like that. Betrayed. That's the word. He betrayed God. He betrayed Jesus and had to be replaced. But even if you go a little further in the book of Acts, Yes, several more of the apostles died before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And we could go to 24, chapter 24, verse 32 through 35 to talk about that a little bit. Um, well, let's go ahead and do that because that is important. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 32 through 35, Jesus says there, Learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that He is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will not pass away, or will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So this generation will not pass until all these things take place. Um, all these things happen. So, before that time, and I, I, I have, I have an, my thought on this is that AD 70 was, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem was a very important moment, and it's so important that God puts it in the New Testament. Not the destruction itself, but prophesies about it. Um, I believe that's what Revelation is about. Um, it's mostly about the destruction of Jerusalem and warning Christians, warning disciples, this is what is going to happen. Uh, it's that final warning from John, from God, about, hey, it's coming, be ready. And, of course, there's also the idea of the victory in that um, Jew and Gentile alike, uh, I mean, Gentiles are going to be fully welcomed in the kingdom because there's not going to be this Jewish, this idea of this Jewish kingdom anymore. Um, so, anyway... The idea of the generation not passing away is, it means that it is coming. It is soon. It is very soon. All right. Moving on now, let's see. Uh, let's try to get into chapter 17. Um, and this one is interesting. Again, it's the apostles here and the rejection of the superior. Verses 1 through 8, we read about the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother. Uh, Peter, James, and John, his brother, uh, John, James' brother, I guess, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So, um, it's interesting how we read about Peter. I mean, Peter is always vocal. Uh, he is very much extroverted in his thoughts. And uh, it's often those times when he says he speaks too rashly. I mean, he wants to do what's right. He wants to do what's right. But he's, he seems to grasp things. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he you know, kind of misses it a little bit. Um, but what do we see? Well... What Peter saw was Jesus with Moses and Elijah. That's what Peter saw. That's what James and John saw, but Peter's the one who, who said it. Uh, but 
and and we see that in him saying, and we see that in him saying, "If you wish," and I think that's kind of interesting. He he he's still getting it a little bit. I think he's getting a hint that Jesus is actually the superior, and so maybe he's not rejecting the superior. He just thinks there's more that could happen to this. If you wish, I want you to notice that um, he's asking for permission. If you wish. He doesn't just say, hey, let's do this. He says, if you wish. And he's going to find out that is not what God wishes. Three tabernacles. Uh, he wants to make each one their own little place. Because, you know, in his mind as a Jew, um, the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah, are really important. And they are important because what they do is they work together and lead us to Jesus. Um, they, they show us Jesus. Uh, but they are important. But what do we find out? That it's not Jesus with Moses and Elijah, but it's Jesus over Moses and Elijah. Uh, God says, this is my beloved son, uh, which I think is a beautiful beautiful picture to be painted and with whom I am well pleased and I put that little code there as a reminder for me um, what that means I am well pleased it's kind of I don't know if it comes across in English very well or not uh, but the tense of that verb that Matthew uses it's a past tense but it also kind of shows a almost almost a state of being. Uh, almost, I mean, you, we kind of see that with the translation, I am well pleased. That am is a state of being verb. Uh, it's a being verb. Um, but the, the tense kind of shows this point um, and makes it, makes it a point for all time. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So, uh, that's a that's a fun one. I probably should think about that one a little bit more, and and it it could mean a whole lot, could mean a lot. So he says, but G, but God says, listen to him. He's the one who's important. You know, the law and the prophets. Yeah, they have their purpose, and they are bringing us around to the point. Jesus, the answer to every question in Bible study. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Yeah, people want to listen to the Law and Prophets, and you know they, they do offer some good things, but listen to Him. He's superior. He's the one who's telling you what all of that was about. Listen to Him. Um, and it's good to listen to the Law and Prophets, I suppose, because, I mean, think about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke, in the book of Luke, the rich man wants to send Lazarus or send someone to tell his brothers not to continue on the path that they're on. Um, and Abraham says, they have Moses. They have the prophets. Let, let them listen. And then he says, if, uh, if, he doesn't, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they listen, even if someone rises from the dead. And uh, yeah, so it's important to listen to the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, because they are telling us what's coming, or they were telling us what was coming. Um, but you know, like the Hebrews writer says, it's a shadow of good things to come, of the substance that is happening, or that will happen, that, that we have now. All right. Uh, there's a rejection of the forerunner, verses 9 through 13. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Oh, so there's, there's where they get to start telling people. Well, Jesus identifies that point anyway. And His disciples asked Him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And He answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize Him, but did to Him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that He had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Um, they rejected the forerunner. 
Now, I think this might be uh, an explanation of the three tabernacles suggestion. Um, I need to do some more research on that because, I mean, they're saying, I think Peter was saying maybe that wasn't that Elijah that was supposed to be here? I mean, before all of this takes place, doesn't Elijah have to come? So we should have built him a tabernacle? Um, but then why was Moses there? Is there something that says Moses has to return? And I've got to, I've got to go back and look at that some more. Um, but the point is, the point that Jesus makes is Elijah already came. Elijah arrived, but the people rejected him, and they're going to reject Jesus too. They're going to reject Jesus too. Uh, so the apostles did figure out John the baptizer's role in this. His role was that of Elijah uh, and kind of fulfills the, the prophecy of, I mean, he fulfills the prophecy of uh, making the path straight uh, for the king. Uh, for the, I mean, he is the crier. He's the one who says, the king is coming. The king is coming. Make ready. Be ready for the king. So they figured out that was John's role. Uh, but have they figured out Jesus' role yet? Have they figured out Jesus' role yet? All right. Next we read about the rejection of God's power, verses 14 through 21. I wanted to get through chapter 17 today, and I think we might be able to do it. Yes. All right. 14 through 21. When they came to a crowd... Uh, to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I, bought him, I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him. And the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? He said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have, the faith, have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now that last verse is kind of interesting, so we'll talk about that uh, in a in a moment. But I want you to notice um, the man says your disciples could not cure him. And I, you know, go back to chapter 10 was it? And uh, in chapter 10 Jesus sends them on the limited commission and they are healing people. Um, but they can't do it here. They can't do it here. And I wonder if it goes back to something they said when they came back to Jesus. They said, even the demons are subject to us. To us. Uh, it's not quite you. It's not quite you. And so I wonder if their pride got in the way because Jesus cured him at once. And that's a fun point. And that's, that's the point of miracles, isn't it? Uh, the miracles are not just that they are healed, but that they are healed at once. They are healed completely. They are healed perfectly. They are healed uh, in a way that is not physically possible. That, that's why it's a miracle, right? Um, so Jesus healed him at once, but why couldn't the apostles do it? We already touched on that a little bit. Why could we not cure him? And... Jesus says, talks about their lack of faith. They didn't have faith. They, maybe they were thinking about their own power. And then he says this, lack of prayer and fasting. Now I'll put that in brackets because in the New American Standard, uh, it's in square brackets as well, which means, oh, I know people don't like it, but, and I'm not even sure how I feel about it. You know, the oldest and best manuscripts, um, don't have this verse. So it's entirely possible that this was an interpolation by someone um, who just wanted an explanation. And I think maybe, maybe this is, maybe it is a commentary. Um, maybe it is divine commentary. Maybe it is Jesus' words. Maybe it is Matthew's writing. Or maybe it's tradition that was passed down. 
Uh, maybe it is maybe it's just someone who decided, uh, this needs some explanation, and they, they put it in. And I think the answer is probably still the same. It's uh, that they were, they were rejecting God's power in, in this. They were thinking, oh, this is mine. Even the demons are subject to us. Well, why is this demon not subject to us? Because you're thinking of it wrong. It's not to us. It's subject to God. Um, so they rejected God's power. I also wonder if maybe there's a rejection. Um, I don't know if there's a rejection on the side of the Father or not. But I don't know. No, it has to be on the Apostles' side. All right. Rejection of the unavoidable. Verses 22 and 23. While they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill Him, and, they, and He will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. And this kind of goes back to what Peter said earlier. Uh, he rebuked Jesus for something like this. Um, but they're grieved. And I think I can understand it. Uh, Jesus understands it, certainly. Um, but like Jesus says um, a little later, I think it's in John, He says, I have to go away. Otherwise, the paraclete, the comforter, won't come. Um, so it's, yes, it's in, in a way it's something to be grieved because... Maybe, I mean, there's this lack of faith. Maybe you don't know what's going to happen. But, uh, you know, they need to just keep going. Uh, and they are deeply grieved. All right. Uh, next, verses 24 through 27, there is a rejection of the sons. And this is the last passage we're going to talk about today. This is a fun one for me. Uh, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, yes. Wait a minute, does your teacher not pay? Hmm, it just hit me that I wonder which one Peter's affirming. Anyway, uh, when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax from their sons or from strangers? When Peter said, from strangers, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However... So that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. So Jesus is saying that in rejecting the sons, they reject the kingdom. In rejecting the Son of God, they're rejecting the kingdom. In rejecting the fact that the sons are paying the, the poll tax. Uh, well, in, in, in charging this poll tax, in my mind, in charging this poll tax, they're saying, you're not sons. You're not sons. You're strangers. Um, so they ask, does Jesus pay, or I guess in this case, does Jesus not pay the required free will offering? See, there's an oxymoron there. There's a required free will offering. It doesn't make any sense. That, that's, that, that, those are contradictory terms. It can't be required and free will. But does Jesus pay it or does not Jesus pay it? Uh, they want a simple answer, yes or no. And focusing on the word required, I, I was going by the, uh, the idea or going in, going in the idea that this was asking, does Jesus pay? Peter says, yes. So I think he's saying, yes, Jesus pays this tax. But he answered prematurely thinking, wait a minute. And then he thought, wait a minute, does, does he really? I've, I don't know that I've ever seen him pay this temple tax. So he goes and he asks Jesus about it. Does he? Do, do you pay? But Jesus speaks first. I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting that, I mean, I shouldn't. But I mean, I know who Jesus is. And several times throughout the scriptures he says, uh, the, the scriptures say that he knows people's he knows what people are going to ask before they ask, and uh, he says he uh, Matthew says that he re he speaks Jesus speaks first so 
He's already, he already knows the question that's going to come. He already knows the question that's happening. He knows that Peter was going to ask about it. And he taught first. And I think the lesson is that God provides. You know, one of the things that we, uh, we like to say in our, um, in our, uh, communion table talk. Well, when we, so, you know, as most, if you're a member of the Church of Christ, you understand this point. Um, you know, we often do the Lord's Supper, and then at the end, we often say, separate apart from the Lord's Supper is the contribution, the free will offering. They're not required. It's not a required free will offering. It's not a tithe. It's a honest-to-goodness free will offering. You choose what to give. And, you know, Pre-COVID, we throw it in the tray as we pass the tray along. And right now, we have the tray set up in the back. But one of the points that we always like to make is, um, is that this is giving back to the Lord what He's given us. And, you know, this is thing, these are things that the Lord has provided. And He provides for this giving that we have that allows the work of the church to continue. So I think this is an interesting um, point about the... Um, you know, about our giving that we, we do. All right, well, that ends chapter 17, and we'll start chapter 18 next week as we continue looking at the rejection of the kingdom. Um, let's see, we are at 51 minutes, so we'll go ahead and call it a night here. I hope you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this lesson. Uh, and hope it encourages you a little bit to not reject God. Uh, you know, we see so many examples of people rejecting Jesus and rejecting His kingdom, but He is still offering uh, the invitation. And He's yet to offer Himself, and He's about to. He's about to offer Himself as the sacrifice for your sin, for my sin, for the sin of the whole world, that whoever will accept that sacrifice, whoever will say, yes, that is the sacrifice for me, Whoever will be washed in the blood of the Lamb, whoever will be baptized in order to have their sins washed away, they will uh, they'll be saved. They can enter into the kingdom and be saved. So I want to encourage you uh, to find out what Jesus would have you do. Uh, you can join us. If you have any questions, you can join us in person Sunday morning at... Uh, 9.15 for Bible study, 10 o'clock for our worship service. This Sunday uh, we are having a guest speaker. We're doing a pulpit swap for with the Area Churches of Christ. And our guest speaker will be Brother Brent Donahoe of the Martinsburg congregation. Uh, so you'll, see it, you'll get to see him instead of me uh, on Sunday. And I know many of you might be, yay! I kid, I kid, I kid. Um, but uh, Brent is a good preacher. You're going to love his lesson, I'm sure. Whatever, whatever he preaches is usually really, really smart, really wise, really good. So I look forward to watching it as, uh, on the rebroadcast. Uh, so join us then if you have any questions. And at, six, no, at 5 p.m. on Sunday evening, uh, you can meet us here at the church building, 14175 Green Street Northeast in Palmyra, Indiana. We're just south of the intersection of uh, Indiana 135 and U.S. 150. I think I got those numbers right. Yeah, that's right. US 150, Indiana 135. We're just south of that intersection. And if you have any comments or questions or urgent needs, uh, you can give us a call at 812-364-6215. Leave a message on the voicemail. Uh, or you can email me at preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org. You can also like us on Facebook. Uh, like this YouTube channel. Comment on the video. Subscribe. Um, and... Hopefully I'll see you uh, See you here. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm running out of time. I've got to go. So uh, you have your responsibility for your own closing prayer. But be virtually dismissed and see you next time on Bible Study Pal.